Good evening, folks. It's your mandated reporter and, frankly, I'm mortified, Mark Radledge. And this is Source Material Live, the show Jesse abandoned to give out the ends in the OIO that I have run away with. We mm-hmm. don't pre-tape the show here. We are live. We are in charge. And we are running wild. It's Chris Sheehan month. Chris Sheehan Come on down. How are you, sir? I'm so excited to be here. How are you? How are you? Uh, I'm yes, doing all right. It's, it, it's my month, and uh, we're talking about stuff I like. And uh, Have you today, ever had a uh, month dedicated to you by somebody else? You know what? I don't think I've even had a day dedicated to me by someone else. So this <laughs> is this is uh, actually far more touching than I expected. So, yes, I am moved, and uh, frankly, I'm at a loss for words. But uh, It's how I show the to, love, buddy. It's how I show the love. Oh, man. Someone's got to. So I very much appreciate it. Well, this uh, yes. week, th- sorry, this, this week we are reviewing Doom Patrol Season 2. Uh, Jesse, the aforementioned Jesse, will be on tomorrow. There'll be no Metal Hammer, Hammer of Doom this week. But uh, he owes me one show per week. And so I said, instead mm-hmm. of doing the Metal Hammer of Doom, um, since we did Doom Patrol Season 1 together, why don't you do season two with me and that's your show obligation for the week and he said what obligation i'm under no contract to you and i said great see you tuesday um, there you go <laughs> so uh that's when i turned to mr sheehan and said hey the last book i picked uh you used the phrase this is all about getting the band back together i picked mm-hmm. uh doom patrol volume one brick by brick yes and uh, we did that show last summer. This was Gerard Way's Doom Patrol. Young Animal book. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I said, okay, you know, and we had talked about the Grant Morrison run. And so when I said, Chris Sheehan, pick a Doom Patrol book, you picked the beginning of the Grant Morrison run. The trade mm-hmm. paperback is entitled Doom Patrol Volume 1 Crawling from Wreck- the Wreckage, which collects issues 19 through 25 of the series but the actual storyline crawling from the wreckage i think goes from issues 19 to 22 22 yeah yeah um and so before we get into why you wanted to start here i think you know the answer at least at a base level the answer is pretty um pretty easy to figure out grant morrison is probably best known for his Doom Patrol run. How did you, Chris, Mm -hmm. come to Doom Patrol? Why do you love them so much? It's funny. uh, This is actually... uh, The first Doom Patrol I ever read was this very trade paperback that I'm looking at right now. Um, I heard so many crazy things about Grant Morrison, but I was a Marvel kid. So I didn't really see much more. And I heard about all the interesting stuff he did on Animal Man, all the interesting stuff he did on Doom Patrol, things like the Invisibles, which are you familiar with the Invisibles? I am not. Okay, well, the Invisibles is the series. It's a series of series that Morrison did for Vertigo, which if you've you've seen The Matrix, I have. Okay, then you've you've read the Invisibles because The Matrix kind of ripped off the Invisibles. (laughs) 
very okay. similar. It's one of the reasons why Morrison left DC Comics was because uh, Warner Brothers, Matrix, feels like they stole a lot of his stuff. But when he was working on The Invisibles, sales were tanking. And uh, one of the first times I ever heard about Graham Morrison was when his sales were tanking on The Invisibles. And so in the letters pages of The Invisibles, he wanted his readers to focus on a sigil. Now, I don't know exactly what this sigil might look like, but he picked a day and a time where he wanted all of his readers to focus on this sigil and masturbate to get his sales up. I don't know if it worked or not, but he he was able to finish the work, so I'm guessing it did. So that was one of the first things I ever heard about this guy. So when I heard that he was coming over to the X-Men, I kind of, my you know, it piqued my interest. And uh, Morrison did come over to the X-Men, uh, X-Men Volume 2, which they even renamed. They renamed it to New X-Men when he came on. He came on with the artist Frank Quitely and totally, like, rocked my world, you know. And I had heard that he had done great things on the JLA over at DC, where he brought back the, you know, the Mag- Magnificent Seven era, you know. All the heroes you've actually heard of were on the JLA instead of people like Nuclon, you know, and Obsidian. You actually had Superman, Green Lantern, Flash, Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, uh, Wonder Woman, Batman. You had everybody there. It was like a big-budget movie every single month. I was still a Marvel guy, so I really wasn't paying attention to that stuff. But as an X-Men fan, and, you know, when you talk about the X-Men and you try to figure out what's their opposite number, what what is their... What's the DC approximation? As close as you can get. And some people say the Doom Patrol is more like the Fantastic Four, and there is merit to that. But a lot of it is very, very similar to the X-Men. And so I find out Morrison, this guy who was totally turning everything upside down on new X-Men, had this fantastic Doom Patrol run. Well, I needed to read it. Only back issues were still kind of spendy back then. This was not too far after the bubble burst. And the bubble burst was kind of like a, it was kind of like a wave and a trickle, you know, like the bubble burst, people stopped buying comics, you know, the, the, the speculators and whatnot, but comic shops took a little while to, to correct, to kind of correct course here. So books that were a few weeks old were going into the bins and they were being marked up three or $4 a pop because that's what they were used to doing back in the nineties. So I wasn't able to buy these things, the single issues of Doom Patrol, but I did find out there was one trade paperback out, which is Crawling from the Wreckage. And for the longest time, that was the only trade paperback out outside of the uh, Silver Age archives, which were $50 each. So I came over to Doom Patrol with this trade, picked it up knowing absolutely nothing about any of these characters. I, I don't think I'd ever read a story with Robot Man in it. I you know I don't know if I knew anybody here that I could uh, actually name on site and uh, fell in love right away. It doesn't take long for this book to kind of get under your skin, and it did. And for the longest time, this was the only damn trade out, so I had to wait until they finally released the rest of it. But uh, it's uh, you know it's it, to me it's the DC it's DC's X Men. Uh, I know that's a somewhat controversial statement depending on your point of view, but. I equate them uh, because, you know, they're equally strange and uh, they're equally outsiders. And uh, it's just a it's just a fantastic book. And uh, I've never let go. And uh, to this point, I've I think out of every Doom Patrol comic, I think I need like a dozen of them to have every single one going back to, you know, the the early 60s. Crawling from the wreckage. Is this your favorite Doom Patrol uh, story? You know, um, Yes and no, because I look at the Morrison run as its own, uh, the whole thing as a story. Because things that are that are mentioned here, things that kind of start to percolate here, they don't pay off for a long time. Uh, the Morrison run, and, and I mean, I know people hate it when you say the Morrison run, but this is the Morrison run. And uh, if you read this from beginning to end, you would get one hell of a satisfying story. Uh, you wouldn't need anything else if you didn't want anything else. Uh, the the creator who follows this up was Rachel Pollock, who did a Morrison approximation, um, which was okay. Uh, a lot of people kind of crap on it, but it was okay. Um, but this entire run, from issues 19 to, I think it's 64, 
excellent stuff here. Um, unmatched to me as it pertains to Doom Patrol. Well, let's get into our story here. Issue number 19. Um, and the only way to get into issue number 19 is to talk about issue number 18. Because apparently <laughs> issue number 18, all kinds of shit happens. And number 19 is sort of the aftermath and the new beginning for the Doom Patrol. So set up our story here. What happened to the Doom Patrol leading into 19? Oh, there was this little story called The Invasion. Are you familiar with, familiar with The ev- Invasion? No. Okay, The Invasion was a way for DC to kind of... It was what we started hearing the term metahuman. It was a way to differentiate, like, what is a superhero? Are they superhuman? Are they are they this? Are they that? They were metahumans. Um, and then the, there were dominators from space who set off a gene bomb that triggered latent metahuman qualities in various... Oh, they did something like this normal in humans. of S.H.I.E.L.D. on TV. But the Inhumans... Oh. Oh, screw the Inhumans. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Inhumans suck. They suck. They, the people care less about the Inhumans than they do Alpha Flight. There's that. But uh, the, the gene bomb went off. So, like, you had characters like Maxwell Lord, the the, the boss over at, J, uh, at the Justice League International. This triggered him to have mind control powers. And when he would use his mind control powers, his nose would bleed and all that kind of stuff. They use the invasion as a way to kind of decimate the Doom Patrol. Um, the writer of the pre-Morrison run was a man by the name of uh, uh, Paul Kupperberg. And Kupperberg was a big Doom Patrol fan and uh, actually brought back the Doom Patrol in the mid-70s in a couple of issues of Showcase that didn't go anywhere. So basically, he set up this story in the mid to late 70s that didn't actually get his own series until, like, 1986, 1987. So he was playing the long game here. Now, his story was kind of, you know, if Doom Patrol is to, is to X-Men, the Kupperberg Doom Patrol is kind of to New Mutants. So he had these new characters come in, like, uh, like you had... Uh, uh, Lodestone and uh, Karma, not the Karma from New Mutants, clearly. And, uh, oh God, the other one who didn't even get his name until after he died. I don't remember his name, though. But you had these, like, these three young characters. You had you had some of the classic, you had, you know, Robot Man was helping to mentor them. You had a woman claiming to be the Chief's wife was there. Uh, Celsius was there. Negative Woman was there. Um, Val- Valeria Volstock or whatever. Morrison was going to come on the book with issue 19. Didn't want to deal with any of that crap. And so they used Invasion to, like I said, decimate the team here. We're going to meet Rhea Jones here, who's Lodestone, in this very volume. She was put into a coma during that, during or around that time. I think maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, but, like, Karma's gone. The other kid, who I forget his name, is gone. Uh, Kupperberg also introduced Dorothy Spinner. Just a... It just is kind of like a background character in a panel because Morrison had asked that he do so. But yeah, the uh, the team here is basically, it's a skeleton crew at this point. Like when we open this up, Robot Man is in, is in a hospital. Uh, Larry is, God only knows what the hell Larry is doing. And uh, we meet someone named uh, Crazy Jane too. So this is a very very skeleton crew doom patrol it's uh, definitely a rebuilding issue it definitely establishes right at the onset that we're reading something totally different i've uh i've done several reading projects of uh the doom patrol the Kupperberg run i don't usually reread very often uh it's not one of my favorites it was good it was like workman like it was you know it was okay but if i'm doing a uh, a reread of doom patrol it usually starts with number 19 but the the tone shift from 18 to 19 is wild here. I mean, we open this issue with a, a nightmare that Robot Man, Robot Man is having of his of his race car accident, where it's like you see him, and I, I believe he's like, he looks like a robotic skeleton kind of, and he's holding his brain because his brain is the only thing he has left of his real life. It's wild. Just that's your first image to come into this new era for the Doom Patrol and it's so tonally different from everything that you saw in the previous 18 issues plus the annual, plus the special, plus the Suicide Squad appearance 
totally different, totally different stuff. And uh, it really hit the ground running. Uh, okay, so following the disastrous events, as you just explained, of the last issue, Cliff Steele has checked himself into a psychi- psychiatric hospital. The implications of his existence as a human brain severed from its host body and placed into a lumbering robotic apparatus, getting him down somewhat. Calder, who plans to start his June Patrol anew, has arranged it that Will Magnus, the creator of Cliff's new body, visit him. Magnus is at first shocked by Robot Man's lack of gratitude and self-loathing, but points out to him that he isn't the only creature upon the Earth to feel suffering, introducing him to another patient, Crazy Jane. Meanwhile, Larry Trainer, the negative man, recovering in a hospital, is set upon by a dark apparition, arranging it that nurse Eleanor... She's a doctor. Dr. Mm. Eleanor Poole and Larry's anatomy is amalgamate in a chemical wedding. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's... <laughs> So I want to talk a lot about Robot Man here because he gets a lot of um, him and Crazy Jane get a lot of play in this first issue. Sure. And you haven't watched the show, but um, no. Robot Man sort of agonizing over his new Being? life as Robot yeah. Man, as a brain inside a tin, ca- uh, you know, inside of you know, a, a knight's armor, essentially a, a steam shovel. Yeah. He can't feel things. And I think the show does a really good job in the first season. Second season gets a little redundant. But the first season, um, Robot Man did a... Re- Brendan Fraser did a really good job of showing the audience what a nightmare it is to feel like you have no purpose. You have a human brain, which is used to running a biological machine that feels and needs fuel... And you know, and, and other kinds of sustenance in order to live, and none of that exists now. And what are you supposed to do with this reality? And mm-hmm. that comes right out of this issue. Oh, he oh, is oh. depressed. He is listless. He is angry, and he wants nothing to do with anything. He has no reason to look forward, and so he's just sitting in a psychiatric institution, just waiting existing. to die. Yeah, 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 waiting to die. Um, they hook him up with Crazy Jane, and this is her first appearance, as near as mm-hmm. I can tell. Yeah, it is. And uh, it is told to us that her 64 different personalities got powers from the Metabomb. And mm-hmm. they talk a little bit about the underground. They don't really get into a lot of detail about it. But Robot Man, just like in the series, they obviously took their relationship from this issue, from this run... Because Robot Man starts to kind of define his reason to go on through taking care of Crazy Jane. 100%. Which I really liked. I liked it in the show, and I liked it that, like, he is redefining himself as he relates to other people. And the first person he relates to and sort of takes on is Crazy Jane. I think Grant Morrison did a really, really good job of... Because Robot Man is very unique in that way. Like, I can't think of another character who's so bereft of meaning and the basic, the basic tenets of humanity. Um, I can't think of another character that is going through that has gone through what Robot Man is going through. And no. it makes him one of the most unique characters in all of comics. Um, totally. And so there's not a lot going on in terms of action in this first issue. I think we're, we're somewhat introduced to the Scissor Men, but they're kind of in the background and we don't know what's going on with them just yet. But a lot of this is getting Robot Man out of the bed and hooking him up with Crazy Jane. And then on the other side of that is redefining what Negative Man is. Now Negative Man is an amalgamation of the Negative Spirit this black doctor and Larry Trainer, mm-hmm. um, I didn't really know what to make of that. I was like, okay, Grant Morrison. I don't know if he did a lot of drugs, but that's certainly how it feels when I read his books. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so your your reactions to what I've said, the, this first issue, the floor is yours. Oh, you're you're dead on. It's uh, Robot Man. Is it's so weird how a character without a literal heart is the heart of this book. Um, He is... 
you know when you when you see him in other takes he is the he's basically the he's the foundation you know everybody can count on this guy and it's easy to forget just what hell his life is right i mean you said it yourself he's got absolutely no meaning here he's there's a scene here like a full page of him bashing his head into a concrete wall over and over and over again just to illustrate that he doesn't feel anything let me jump in here real quick jesse and i have talked about this um there's an episode of black mirror where there's a guy um capturing people's dna and then using it to create avatars of those Mm -hmm. people in a uh, 3D sim. And those people, for all intents and purposes, are the real-life selves, but in this video game. Mm -hmm. And um, he changes some things, like they don't have genitals, and they're, they're just there to be part of his Star Trek fantasy, essentially. And when he's not playing the game, they have nothing to do. Mm-hmm. And I remember one of the characters going, "Yeah, sometimes I just ram my head into things just to know, just just to see if I'll feel anything." Yep. <laughs> and you know, and so Jesse and I have talked about that about the idea of like a virtual reality, and you know, and avatars, and what happens when you no longer have the basic tenets of human life, which is the ability to feel, the ability mm-hmm. to experience pain and joy. And, you know, and the whole battery of human emotion, uh, both psychological and physical, and what that does to a person and why those are necessary elements of life. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, you you basically, what is it, uh, you become an NPC, right? A non-player character. It's just when the game's turned off, you're just there, and uh, you have no meaning. But, uh, yeah, this is... Uh, it's it's really hard to put like to actually phrase it properly here. I'm at a, I'm at a loss for a way of describing it here. But Cliff has been put upon, and he's always put upon, even till the most recent stuff, the the Gerard Way stuff that you know fell apart. He's always looked at as the Rock. He's always looked at as someone who, in a crunch, he'll he'll know what to do. And. Uh, and with this issue here, we're actually allowed to take a step back and realize that, like, all these other people are putting their hopes and their their hopes and their wishes into this one guy who can barely bear to live. Can I ask uh, because, you a question? Sure. Something I've always sort of struggled with, and the show, especially in season two, kind of deal... And I don't want to talk too much about the television show, but... Just as a mm-hmm. point of comparison, because the show does bring things up that I don't know if it was ever addressed in the comic book, but I think it's interesting. Mm-hmm. So in the show, they have Cyborg. Cyborg is part of the Doom yeah. Patrol. And in season two, Robot Man does say, like, I don't understand why you get the fancy uh, robot technology that allows you to have some semblance of a human life. You can feel, you can eat. You can't, you know, you are essentially a functional human being with some robot parts. I'm Mm -hmm. a tin can with a brain. Why can't I have what you have? And I'm wondering if that was ever addressed in the comics. Well, Cyborg was never in the Doom Patrol. Not the the Cyborg part, but 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 why has anyone ever tried to make Robot Man a functional feeling entity? Well, Robot Man is what he is as a result of machinations of the Chief. The Chief, that's, spoiler alert, <laughs> that's the big reveal at the end of the Morrison run, is that the Chief did it. The Chief did it all. Yeah, that, that, Cliff, that was Rita, revealed in the show as well. Oh, oh God. Okay, so yeah, so the Cliff, Rita, and uh, and Larry... They were all, all their accidents were caused by the chief because the chief was lonely. And we could see the chief being lonely here in this very volume where he's like, I really want to put the team back together. And everyone's like, no, the team's dead. He's like, but no, 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 I want to put the team together. No, 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 the team's dead. But but come on, can we? No, the team's dead. So we get that over and over again. But I mean, I think it's a way of, I I think his body was too badly damaged to begin with. 
Mm-hmm. And he was built by um, what's his face here? We see him in this issue. What the hell's his name? The the guy who made the Metal Men, uh, Magnus. Um, I think they just did the best with what they could, and uh, this is what they got. And I feel like his inhumanity makes him more um, valuable to the chief. You know, he he's kind of beholden to the chief. He needs the chief because who who's going to deal with this robot man? He's mm-hmm. not going to live in society. He's not going to be able to just... He's not going to live in the suburbs and, and, you know, mow his lawn every week. He's a damn robot, which is yeah, exactly what the chief he's not going to leave the nest. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, the only one that could leave the nest is the one that, like, stayed dead the longest in Rita. Because Rita, her power was she grew. She stretched. She looked like a normal human being. Larry's wrapped in wraps... Robot man's wrapped in metal. They're kind of stuck. They they're not gonna they're not gonna like you said they're not gonna leave the nest. What's more, they're not gonna join the Justice League. They're not gonna join the Titans. They're they're monsters. They're outsiders, which is by design. Um, anything else about issue nineteen? Um, just that it was uh, it was great. Um, this was the first Doom Patrol comic I've ever read, and. Uh, and it only made me want more. And it's funny because you talk about like how how hard it is to find a jumping on point, right? And you're, we're here at like issue 19. We're after this huge DC Universe spanning crossover event invasion that had all these tie-ins and all this craziness. And then you have this issue, which me, someone who never read anything before, was able to read, was able to appreciate, was able to fall in love with. It really speaks to... Morrison's ability here to kind of control the narrative in a way where if you were reading Doom Patrol forever, you would love this. If you if you were brand new to Doom Patrol, you still loved it. It's, it kind of reminds me of Alan Moore's uh, Swamp Thing. Where Swamp Thing was this one thing and it was sort mm-hmm. of a floundering comic and they brought Monster in comic. Alan Moore yeah. and Alan Moore made it this like phenomenal hit. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of comparisons are made to Morrison and Moore and uh, they hate each other for it. So <laughs> a lot of people will, because uh, uh, I mean, you look, I don't remember what, what year it was that uh, the anatomy lesson happened. I know it was before this, but uh, oh, can I tell you that's like you have things like the anatomy lesson. Ever? The anatomy it's lesson. It's something else in it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, else. it's really good. I mean, like there are certain things that there are certain comic books that transcend comic books. The Killing 100%. Joke is probably the biggest example, the most famous example. Mm-hmm. But the anatomy lesson is somewhere close to that in that... It's in rarefied air. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is truly literature. It is not a funny book. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny because, like, so many of these books I've discovered after the fact, right? Um, talk about, like, Teen Titans' Judas Contract. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge story. One of the biggest stories of the 80s. But when you know the twist, you know the twist. You know Terra's going to turn. So when it happens, you're just like, okay, well, I was expecting that to happen. That's what's going to happen. The Can Great Darkness you, Saga. Sure. I have never read the Judas Contract, but I watched the uh, the animated cartoon. Uh-huh. And I watched it with my daughter. Mm-hmm. And her heart broke when she turned. <laughs> she yeah, broke down into ugly crying I mean, she was, she would never love again. I mean, <laughs> she, you have this to was experience a, it that way. Th- this was a couple of years ago, and she was like, oh, my God, I can't believe yeah. she did. Like, like the, the reaction you want as a writer, my daughter had that, it in spades. A hundred percent. Yeah, because you have to, you have to go into that not knowing the twist, you know, uh, Great Darkness Saga from the Legion. You have to not know that Dark Side's going to show up for it to make, for it to like hit you the way it's supposed to hit you. But with this, with Swamp Thing, the Anatomy Lesson, I knew the twist, and it still got me. You know, it was masterfully done to the to, to the point like to your point, it transcended comics. I knew the twist, I knew what it was before, I knew what it was going to be, but when I actually sat down and read it, it was just like, whew okay he got me that's that's how strong the anatomy lesson is but back back to what i was saying here 
Moore had the anatomy lesson. Morrison has Doom Patrol, and he also has Animal Man, which were both very, very meta, both very turning a weird and obscure concept on its ear and making it more than what it was. Uh, Have you read Animal Man? I have not. Okay, maybe we'll have to put that somewhere on the docket here. Animal Man becomes a commentary on comics back before commentaries on comics were done every friggin' month. Nowadays, we do the meta crap constantly because the writers all think they're far cleverer than they are. Morrison did it first. Or Morrison did it on a grander stage first. I mean, it, with it Animal- wasn't invented when uh, with Deadpool? Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, I would... Chris says, all right, love, I'm done with this podcast. <laughs> I would love to show a kid Ambush Bug. Just, like, get, get me a teenager, and I'll show him Ambush Bug and see him say, oh, that's a ripoff of Deadpool. Because, <laughs> no, it's kind of the other way around. But uh, So I don't know if it, this will make sense to you or not. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if music is kind of like movies and television with you. But you're are you at all familiar with Fuck the Police by NWA? Who? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So I believe it was Bone Thugs and Harmony. I may have to look this up. But for the purposes of the story, let's mm-hmm. just go with this. So Bone Thugs sure. and Harmony. Are you familiar with the band at all? Uh-huh. Like, the, like you know they exist. Bum, 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 yeah, bum. yeah, the Crossroads. Um, it's all the ones that's the one the way all the white people know. That's it. Uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony did a cover of mm-hmm. "Fuck the Police" by N.W.A. Yeah. And uh, twenty years ago or so, when I first got into social work, I was transporting some teenage kids in a program from one place to another, and we were listening to music. And I had on, um, I want to say it was. Whatever I can't remember the name of the band, but whatever the white band was that did like the acoustic cover of, um, and you know what? <sighs> That's Boys in the Hood. Um, so okay, so it must have been. I must have had on some. You know what it was? It was. Um, I either had the original or some other version. Mm-hmm. It was probably the original. For the purposes of this story, it was the original. There we go. Um, I had on the original NWA Fuck the Police because mm-hmm. I was an idiot and would play that in front of kids. <laughs> and and I remember the one kid, the eldest in the group, and the one who was an identified gang member, say, who is this? And I'm like, this is NWA. They're like, they're copying. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, they copied. They ripped them off. And I'm like, first of all, it's called a cover. Which is, you know, something that bands do. This is a natural order yeah. of things. Sure. Bands cover other bands. Second of all, Bone Thugs and Harmony didn't write Fuck the Police. NWA did, and they did it like 20 years ago. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably 10, dead 10 years ago, I should say. But um, <laughs> 50, 10 to 15. But, yeah, like, that, that, that's what you get with a lot of kids is, is they'll be like, oh, no you know, they, they think whatever the most yep. modern thing is is the original. Exactly, a hundred percent. My my wife was listening to a uh, Janet Jackson song uh, on Spotify or something, mm. and uh, I came through the room and I was like, I'm "Like, are you listening to uh, Ventura Highway?" Mm. Because I'm I'm big into yacht rock, you know. I, I listen to that all the time. And America Ventura Highway. I'm like, "You're listening to yacht rock?" And she's like, "No, it's Janet Jackson." I'm like, "That's that's America. That's that's Ventura Highway." She's like. She's like, no, it's Janet Jackson. I'm like, I'm like, no, I, it's it's Ventura Highway. She's like, they must have copied. Like, <laughs> no, this was sixty years ago, no, fifty years ago. Come on, but uh, yes, yes. There the, was uh, a the lot news. of that with with I think um, it, both Thor Ragnarok with Led Zeppelin and um, what's his face there, Puffy, uh, again with Led Zeppelin. Hmm. All right, um, Scott, we could be here all day talking about this. We could. <laughs> all right, issue number 20 oh, uh, continues the story of crawling from the wreckage. Uh, what uh, the comic vine tells us is the Doom Patrol's new direction continues as the patrol welcomes Rebus, which is the new negative man. And we learn more about Crazy Jane and the Scissor Men start cutting up something fierce. So tell me about issue number 20. What do you like? Um, what's good about this issue? 
I <laughs> anytime I think about this issue, it's always the first couple of pages where the priest gets crushed by a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just funny. so out of nowhere. He's like walking through like a junkyard, and a refrigerator is just dropped on him. <laughs> and that's it. Um, now th this continues the story of uh, we have Cliff talking a bit more to uh, Will Magnus, and he basically tells him to go screw himself. And uh, we get the uh, we get the Scissor Man introduction, which is great because the Scissor Men are. They're, I don't want to say legitimately scary, but as far as comics are concerned, they're pretty damn scary. Uh, it's not often that you get such a... This is, like, unique. It's they're, they're essentially <sighs> zombies. They're zombies More with scissor hands sputtering nonsense. Yeah, yeah, because this is like the uh, William Burroughs thing. I, I think it's William Burroughs. Is that the guy who would just, like, put random words together, like the word yes. soup? Yes. But I think, because that, that's what their, 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 their dialogue is that. Uh, I, I think Morrison even said as much. And it's interesting because we're going to get more Burroughs imagery later on in the second story, too, uh, with uh, Crazy Jane doing some uh, slicing of books here. But I do like the meta elements here and the concept. I mean, we're talking about Robot Man and whether or not, he, you know, is he alive? Is he dead? What is he? Is he real? Is he a real person since he only is a brain? With the Scissor Men, we're getting this weird cut of, like, literally, a cut of what's real, what's not, what's there, what isn't. They're literally cutting people out of existence and sending them somewhere else, which is, it's heady. I, I It's one of the things that I wish I was reading this when it came out, just to see what my pea brain would have thought of it, it in comparison to everything else. It's sort of a non-cosmic Jack Kirby in that it feels like acid-induced. Like, it, it if you... Probably if you, as a writer, are told, here's a book, you can do anything, you have no restrictions, just don't use Superman. <laughs> he will <laughs> use Superman later, too. <laughs> um, yes, issue number 29. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, basically, like, this book is yours. Stay mostly within, in your lane, but your yeah. lane is yours. And you're, like, this super esoteric out of the box thinker and you're like what if we do this and there's no one to say no that's exactly. doom patrol that's that's a lot of because i mean the trade that we're looking at here probably has a vertigo logo on it mm -hmm. even though none of the morrison run was vertigo every the first vertigo doom patrol issue was the issue after morrison left so this is all dc proper and uh, this is uh, this is what we would call proto vertigo. Um, this was such. This is a time that I'm nostalgic for that I wasn't around for. Unfortunately, you had stuff like Doom Patrol. You had Shade the Changing Man with Peter Milligan, which was similar in that it felt like there were no rules. He was just doing whatever he did. It had beautiful Chris Bocciolo artwork. Uh, Sandman with Gaiman, of course. That was DC proper. Um, Swamp Thing another proto vertigo and uh, of course animal man more proto vertigo these were books that were pushing the limits and uh just paying dividends here this is the foundation of everything that vertigo became and for a time vertigo was like the thing in comics this is the this is the the the, the seeds of that it's it's really really great um and yeah the you're you're dead right about that it's just like we're just pushing as far as we can go um it's weird that i mean this is this is the late 80s right well, here's why i say what i say and mm. i won't let you get back to your point but sure when you think about the rubric of comic books mm -hmm. muscly hero good looking hero boy or girl it doesn't matter sure muscly good looking power fantasy hero versus either spindly scientist brainy type or muscly monster mm -hmm. and that's every comic book everywhere all the time that's you just made my next point because <laughs> we're going into the 90s here where there was such a focus on everything you just said the bigger the better the more bombastic the better the 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 mcfarland the liefeld the the big beefy battles <laughs> and then we have something like doom patrol 
you know, right. and it it Which almost like, like well, what if what if he in. fights a sandwich? Like it, it, that's they're the going to fight like, a thing. everything at the wall and going, yeah, no one's here to tell us no. Yup, <laughs> it's true, it's true. There there were a handful of like writer driven books that just like sort of slid right in under the under the radar. Uh, um, I, I talk when I talk about Doom Patrol, this era of Doom Patrol, it's usually. I'll usually say that it's comfort food comics for me. I'm a big believer in comfort food comics. And before I used to spend all my free time making content, I used to actually reread this every year. Uh, this run, and I always associate Doom Patrol, the, the, the Morrison Doom Patrol, for absolutely no reason other than the fact that I enjoy them both at the same time with Peter David's Hulk. Uh, mm. The Peter David Hulk is another... While there was some fantastic art on that, I feel that's a very writer-driven um, series run, however you want to put it. it was, he was there for many, many years, and it was top quality for most of it. Uh, I, I think that... I don't remember what my point was here. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the writer-driven thing here where the borders of what we're going to push was more on the writer than the artist at a time when that balance of power was shifting and shifting drastically uh, across the street at Marvel right now Chris Claremont had reinvigorated the X-Men made it the top selling book in the world you know and they were pulling his power back as this book was coming out they're pulling his power back and giving it to an artist so it's like almost it's almost an impossibility that a book like Doom Patrol exists in this era it's and, uh, it's wild and to Grant Morrison's credit you know I compared him to Jim Lee there are a lot of up its own ass like f philosophy you know philosophy 101 why is there a god sure. you know oh, yeah. the, the kind stuff, of yeah, stuff the... out there that makes no sense and is a hard read and we've done a lot of them on this show where at the end of it I'm like I don't know what the fuck I just read <laughs> um, and, and not even sometimes that sometimes you have you know your 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 big heroes versus your big villains, and if you know the source material drinking game, you know what I'm about to reference. You know, and it's like the ideas are so big and the story is so convoluted, it is impossible to follow. Dark Side War, I'm calling your name I, once again. To everyone, take a drink. You know, I, I, I've I've said before. I think another one that we used to reference was we read a Power Man book, not a Power Man, mm -hmm. uh, Iron Fist book. Okay. And um, when when that show was out, and at the end of it, like something turned into a building, and it was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> there are you know sometimes like, and this is what I mean by like sometimes you need someone to say no. Oh, there of course, are, yeah, you need a filter, yeah. You know, I have to applaud the writers like Grant Morrison who are able to restrain themselves and keep the car on the road. That They're, they're, oh, they're yeah. not just like, I can drive and immediately drive into the forest. Exactly. Losing the reader along the way. Yeah. No, no. Morrison is, he's a true artist. Um, uh, this, yeah, everything in this feels very, very meticulous. Like, and whether it was drug fueled or not, <laughs> he, he knew the direction he was going to go and everything, everything pays off in a satisfying way. And every book that Morrison's ever handed off, the next writer was able to come on and continue where something I talk about a lot on, on you know, the show I do X lapsed. It's I'm, I'm covering current year X-Men stuff where it's very, it's drastically different from any other take on the X-Men. There are things called resurrection protocols where X-Men die and then they're grown again in an egg. It changes everything. Oh, that's that where that reference came from? Okay, because I heard you and Bailey say something about it, and I was like, Wait, yeah. what? Yes, they die, and their their essence, they have a husk that grows in a gold. And their uh, personality and their knowledge is all stored in a Cerebro helmet that's zapped into that body. And I'm really oversimplifying it, because it, the way it's being written, it works really well. But the concern I have is, how do you walk that back? I mean, to, to steal a line from you, a wizard did it, right? I think we're going to need <laughs> we're going to need the wand. Someone's going to a wizard's going to have to come and ding. Okay, we're back to what we were. 
with Morrison when he hands off a book as wild and outside the box as he is, the next writer is able to come on and not miss a beat. Peter mm-hmm. Milligan picked up Animal Man. Boom. Excellent stuff. Rachel Pollack picked up Doom Patrol. Ex- excellent stuff. Chuck Austin. Well, no, we don't talk about Chuck Austin. Um, when he left X-Men, Joe Quesada unfortunately had a vendetta out against Morrison, so he basically undid everything Morrison did in X-Men. So that's the exception, but it kind of proves the rule in that without any interference, you could pick up and just go. Mark Wade picked up from his JLA off to the, you know, hit the ground running. It was, he doesn't break the toys. He makes the toys better than what they were, and he leaves the books better than he found them. And uh, I think that says a lot for someone with the name value of a Morrison, who could come in, shit on everything, leave, and, and get and get blowjobs and handshakes as he walks out the door. He doesn't do that. He he takes care of the properties. He's not a Bendis. He takes care of, care of the properties. He doesn't break the toys. And uh, no matter how crazy it gets, it all makes sense in the wider narrative. And uh, I was gonna say this, this is just this, more of that. This four part story is very straightforward. It's just yeah. weird. Like it's just yeah, esoteric. Yeah. Yeah. The, the monsters are weird. That's mm-hmm. half the book. The other half is relationship building between your main characters, yeah. which is, I don't know if, you could, if as a kid works, you know, maybe it depends on the kid, I guess. Um, but as an adult reading a narrative, that's what I want. That's, that's what I live for. You know, yeah, you know, like I, you, I don't know if you, ever, if you watched Avengers Endgame, nope. but Avengers Endgame, you know, Sure, it ends with this very cathartic fuck off war, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like a payoff to the last twenty one uh, some on movies. Sure, but along the way, you get like Black Widow and Hawkeye's relationship. You get Captain America and Iron Man's relationship. There's a lot of of relationship um, material that they're yeah. dealing with in that yeah. movie. Thor and Hulk, H- Thor and mm-hmm. Ra- Rocket. You know, th- there's a lot of interpersonal relationships happening, and they're playing off of that. Fuck, fuck's sake, War Machine and Nebula had a moment. <laughs> and that's what makes that movie work. Yeah, sure, at the end, mm-hmm. you know, w- when you know, Avengers Assemble, and you have Thanos' army versus the Avengers and everybody else on Earth. Um, it, it, you know, it's just, you know, the punchy parts, but that's, that's, what, sh- that's what you want. But it sure. doesn't. But it becomes a, a, a Disney era Star Wars movie if you don't have the relationships in place. Yeah, you know? I mean that's exactly your your point is well taken. It's it's why something like that will be remembered, right? Right. Uh, for what it was, um, it's why a Doom Patrol. We're talking about it, you know, thirty years later, right now, where we're not talking about an issue of Brigade. We're not talking about an issue of Shadowhawk, which doesn't have interpersonals. It has grunting and fighting. We're also not talking about safe space. And what was the other one? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> screen time? <laughs> yeah. Snowflake? Yeah, <laughs> Snowflake and safe space. But uh, the interpersonals here, and that's another thing that... Um, when I started reading a superhero comics in earnest was with the X-Men, of course. And... Sure, there was a lot of that action stuff. I was coming in at the tail end of the Jim Lee stuff, so it was a lot of hyper-posed, sort of like fashion model X-Men, you know, just just looking cool. And that's all it really was. It still won me over because I was 11, but, you know, a year later, or not even a year later, several months later, after a big, huge crossover event, the new writer, Scott Lobdell, does a story where Professor X has briefly regained the use of his legs and he goes rollerblading with Jubilee. It's the whole fucking issue. Mm -hmm. Professor X rollerblading with Jubilee. These two characters that probably have never shared more than three panels together in the, in the, in as long as Jubilee has been around. And we have this touching heartfelt story where Professor X is rollerblading and then he loses the power of his legs and she has to help him back to his chair. And it's just like, wow. I remember that story. I couldn't tell you a damn thing from Jim Lee, but I remember that story because it it established 
it established that these aren't just characters on a page. These are people that we're reading about who care about each other and who are scared for one another and who care about what each other are going through. And that, that this, this run of Doom Patrol is so much that. Uh, we mentioned it earlier with Robot Man taking this sort of like a custodian role over Crazy Jane here. Despite the fact that Crazy Jane is tons of times more powerful than he is, right? It's just that she's so fractured. Her psyche is just so fractured that he sees her as like a wounded bird. Mm -hmm. And he needs meaning in his life. So ipso facto, yada, 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 he is going to be her caregiver. And she lets him do it. It's almost as though one of her personalities realizes, hey, this guy needs a win. I'm going to give him a win. And we do see her snap into other personalities. They're like, dude, get the hell away from me. But there, there is still a, a heart there where it's like, it's it's for such an inhuman group of people here. They're more human than than most. Issue number twenty one, crawling from the wreckage, part three of four. The scissormen come a calling as the patrol sets up shop in the old Justice League of America former Mountain headquarters. Yeah, it's like in Rhode Island or some shit. Yeah, Happy Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So what happens in issue twenty one? Issue 21, uh, let me make sure I'm talking about the right one here. This, These these four issues kind of blend for me. But uh, I know we have uh, Jane and Robot Man going to the old headquarters, right? Is this where they go to the old headquarters before they go to Happy Harbor and they're, they're ambushed by Scissor Men? And that's, I think, the first time we see Black Annis? Yes. Okay, yeah, so Black Annis is one of the 64 personalities for Crazy Jane and... Uh, Looking at her quick, you might think it's Morbius, the living vampire, because uh, <laughs> it's it's one of the few uh, Crazy Dame personalities that actually changes her outward appearance, which uh, might tell you that there's there's trouble in that one. Um, and, and it also is a depiction of just how powerful, how scary powerful Crazy Jane can be. And uh, let me see here. They go to they they do wind up in Happy Harbor to fill in the chief on everything that went on here, and that's when we start to see the the ossuary, right? Mm -hmm. Is this where Kansas City gets taken over by Bones, and uh, and we see that uh, they they have a Scissor Man captive as well, right? Yes. Do they have? Okay, they have a Scissor Man captive, and then the the other Scissor Men come to rescue this captive, and this is where Josh Clay who is kind of a... Uh, he's like an auxiliary uh, Doom Patrol member at this point. Uh, he was looking to retire. He was part of the second go-around of Doom Patrol, the the Kupperberg one from the late 70s here. He's Celsius. He's got, uh, like, fire and ice powers. And uh, he actually winds up getting cut out of existence by a Scissor Man, which is pretty cool. And I believe this issue ends with the Doom Patrol... Uh, getting ready to let themselves be cut out so they can go rescue Josh. Yeah, that's another element of um, Robot Man's personality is that he's so angry with Niles, you know, and he, his frustration with not dying mm. is so directed at, and maybe misdirected, at Niles that when Niall says, hey, don't do that, Robot Man sort of doubles down and is like, no, this is what we have to do. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Whether it's the right thing or not, it's not what Niall wants, so that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to do, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like he's a little bit of prescience there, but uh, yeah, it's... I, I think you hit it on the head there. It's If not for Niles, he'd be dead. And uh, maybe death would be better than being locked in a robot body. Uh, I always remember... Um, as I said, this was the first Doom Patrol I read, and it's um, the trade is prefaced with an introduction by Grant Morrison where he talks about how the Doom Patrol were different to him growing up because they were the only they were the only team that scared him because they're very weird. Uh, and if you look at some of the old Silver Age stuff, it's not like you know dictionary definition scary, but it's eerie, it's weird, which you weren't really getting a whole lot of in superhero comics at the time and I, and the one line that sticks with me is a uh, it's like a human brain inside a uh, inside a steam shovel or someone with a steam shovel jaw or something like that and uh it's so crazy to consider that young Grant Morrison was so 
disturbed by this character that when he actually comes on to like reinvent the character it's uh, the, the, how, we, how it's established is really really cool and um uh, the fact that this is a this is a property that kind of freaked him out, and he's just kind of playing with it here, and the fact that Robot Man, as weird as he is here, he owes everything and he blames everything on his you know pseudo creator in in Niles here. So him being rebellious here is a really cool touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's the only one with uh, with any real animus towards Niles. I mean, Crazy Jane. I think has her hands full with just trying to keep the balls of her personality in the air. And Rebus, which is this amalgamation of the negative energy and the Doctor and Larry, yep. is kind of a non-entity. I didn't talk about that because we haven't really talked about that character. What did sure. you think? I mean, the, the character does stuff, but doesn't seem to register a personality. It just sort Not of... Not yet. It, yeah, it just sort of exists. What did yeah. you think of that character up to this part of the book? I liked it a lot. Um, I, and again, I didn't know Larry Trainer, So this was the first time I saw him. And it's it's kind of hard for me to reconcile the fact that he's not Rebus, it, you know, in other takes on the Doom Patrol, because Rebus worked so well for me. Rebus is scary. Rebus is weird. It's Sometimes it's a man. Sometimes it's a woman. Uh, sometimes it has curves. Sometimes it doesn't. It's a very, very strange character, um, and it's going to get even stranger as we go on here. It's it's really, really fantastic stuff. Um, as, as for Robot Man here, I, he's almost Bob Newhart, you know. If you've ever watched Newhart, the the one from the eighties, Bob Newhart would be like the only normal person in any given scene. You know, he he would be surrounded by like Larry and the Darrells, uh, you know, the yuppies. The other weird hillbillies, the like the crooked cop, and then you'd have normal Bob Newhart just trying to make sense of everything and just dealing with life, the life that he's been dealt here. That to me is Robot Man. You have this like wacky assemblage of people here, just like, yeah, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And he's just like, okay, this is what we'll do. It just seemed uh, he's. It's so weird to have the most the most inhuman of them be the straight man. It's pretty interesting. And now the glorious conclusion. The new Doom Patrol mm-hmm. takes the battle with the Scissor Men to their home dimension in the sinister city of Bone. And this is issue number 22. All right. So we're here. Uh, they, they fight the Scissor Men. I have to say, like, when they're in the, that world and you see all of the souls that they've cut out and they all look ba- basically like paper dolls, they're sort of, you know, sort mm-hmm. of bent. <laughs> you know? Like, like one dimensional, yeah. Yeah, uh, like it is an eerie, eerie presentation. It is. Oh, it is. It very much is here. It's, and that's just another one of those reasons why I wish I was able to experience this when it came out because it is just so different from anything I'd seen before, even to today. I mean, a lot of people have done their takes on. I mean, when you talk about Grant Morrison, if you're not a fan of Grant Morrison, the first thing that comes to mind is probably weird for weird's sake, which is very dismissive. It's very, it's an oversimplification. But uh, if you did try to do your weird for weird's sake sort of storytelling, you'd probably do something sort of like this. But uh, this being the first time you'd see something sort of like this, it, it's very off-putting and it's very, very bizarre. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things... I remember Doom Patrol coming out uh, when I was when I was out there buying X Men comics, and the covers of Doom Patrol. Have you have you seen some of the later co- covers? I mean, of, I'm uh, looking this one? at from 22 to 33 right now. One of them okay, looks like a Lobo the, cover. That's what I was just about to say. The covers turn into these like horrors. Like it looks like meat. Everything looks like meat. And the, there were some really cool covers in that, but growing up, it freaked me the hell out. I didn't want that in my house. <laughs> I wasn't looking for Doom Patrol anyway, but the fact that they these covers were just so off-putting and ugly, and they looked just like sculptures made out of meat. I didn't want them. You look at the inside of this here, and it's Richard Case, which is fantastic stuff for this tone of book, and it's still very, very bizarre. It's It's imagery that'll stick with you which uh, 
you don't really get too often. I think we have a glut of of comics these days where, you know, I couldn't tell you what cover goes to what book nowadays, but with something like this, it sticks with you to the point where you'll always be able to associate it. So I'll let you sum it up for me. How does our story end? Okay, now this is one of those endings that you're either going to love or you're going to (laughs) hate. You're going to think it's like the world's most convenient cop-out, or you're going to see the cleverness in it. And it's, we have these two kings or two popes of some sort, right, that run this ossuary. One's dressed in white, one's dressed in black. It's the old fable thing where one's a lie. One always tells the truth and one always lies. And it's kind of a uh, 2001 sort of situation, right, where you have to, like, you have to kind of just jam the computer with a question. Is, is that am I th- is that the right reference, or is that a different thing I'm thinking about? No, you got it. Okay, okay. So Larry, he's got the, or Rebus, I guess we're not allowed to call him Larry, he'll snap at us, but uh, he has the ability to get past the scissor men and actually infiltrate in to talk with these two popes. And and they do, they, they are wearing the papal gear and stuff. And he has this question, and he found out that this question because Crazy Jane did the William S. Burroughs thing and chopped up a bunch of books and put a bunch of pages together and was able to come up with the yeah, the gimmick here. That's one thing we didn't mention was that they didn't know how to get to where they're going to. Is this no, that's the next book. That's the next story. I'm sorry. No, this isn't the Burroughs one. This is where they just let themselves get cut up. But they had this question that they wanted to ask to the popes. And the question was, what was it? How do you know if there's nothing why is there something instead of nothing? Is that the question? Uh something along those lines. Give me a second and I can get it for you. Okay. I, I actually, I just found it. Why, yeah, why is there something instead of nothing? So you have one pope who says, I always lie. You have one pope that says, there's always the truth. But neither of them know. They said they don't know why. So he knows the liar actually does know. So he asked the liar, why is there something instead of nothing? And the liar says there is something instead of nothing. But he's lying, so there's really nothing instead of something. Which causes the entire place to just vanish. <laughs> Yeah, the, I don't know if you've it's ever seen it. It's something you'll love it, or you'll hate. I, it reminded me of a Star Trek The Next Generation episode with the Borg. Where I have never seen anything with the word Star Trek in the title. For time's sake and for brevity, um, the Borg are powerful, have greater technology, and are on nearly impossible for the Federation to beat. <laughs> so they kidnap one of the Borg. They're going to insert into him... A lo- uh, an algorithm that is like impossible to solve and they're going to have mm-hmm. him go back to the Borg and the Borg are essentially going to be in an internal state of beach ball do you know what beach ball hmm. is? no when you have a Mac and it's mm-hmm. thinking and it's processing oh, and oh it yes yes and the spins yeah gotcha yeah. gotcha right so the Borg would be in an, inter- an eternal state of beach ball and then the Federation would win They'd, yeah, the gotcha. board would be left defenseless. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what this reminded me of, you know, because you have the two popes and they, you know, they, they're controlling this this army of zombies. And essentially, the negative man asks it a question, and it just has a meltdown. <laughs> like, yeah, because like, the whole I, the whole actually, thing here is brilliant. none of this is real. Yeah, and like none of this is real, but they have to actually get to the point where they realize that none of it's real. So they have to actually trigger <laughs> the fact that it isn't real uh, to take it out of reality, and this is the issue where it kind of, it ends with uh, it ends with the the band coming back together. Um, Cliff finally comes around, and we have officially our new Doom Patrol, and uh, the chief is very very pleased because he won't be left alone for at least a little while. But I believe we get epilogues here, right? Yes, yeah, so we, we have do, epilogues yes. that are pointing yeah, we get... to. Uh, Mr. Nobody. Yes, we have Mr. Nobody, and then we also have one with uh, Rhea, uh, Rhea Jones in her coma, yep. which is uh, which will be the first appearance of the man we're going to meet in the very next issue. Yeah, issue 23 and 24 are a two-part story featuring the villain Red Jack, who believes he is a <clears throat> amalgamation of Jack the Ripper Every and Jack. God. Spring Hill Jack, every Jack. <laughs> and he tortures butterflies because he needs pain to live. And he's mm-hmm. decided he wants a girlfriend. And, like, I don't blame him. Uh, the best girlfriend is one that's comatose. <laughs> 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 
this one's for the ladies. Um, <laughs> so he kidnaps Lodestone, and then the Doom yeah. Patrol go after him. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, this is uh, this is the issue I was uh, I mistakenly mentioned earlier, where to, in order to get into Red Jack's realm here, uh, Crazy Jane has to figure out how to how to do so, and uh, this, which one of her. Uh, God, which one of her personalities is the one that can analyze things? It's the nun or something like that. Sister. Yeah, it's like sister something or another. But yeah, they read a black book and uh, find out that they need to find out how to get into this this other world here. So she goes, she she walks through a bookstore window, literally walking through it uh, to get books so she could chop them up and make like word soup to uh, to figure out how to do it. And I love Robot Man's, uh, like, he's like, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> There's a door right there. She's like, I know. I'm in a lot of pain right now. And uh, and he hands over, like, a business card. He's like, oh, we'll, we'll pay for this. Sorry. But uh, And he tells kids, like, a GI, at the end of a G.I. Joe episode, he's like, kids, don't go, don't go walking through windows. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. Uh, it's also here that uh, Dorothy Spinner, she uh, moves in. And... Uh, She's another one that was very, very off-putting to me at first because she's very bizarre looking. She, uh, she's the ape, gir- ape girl, so she's bizarre for sure. And we're going to learn a little bit more about her in the last issue of this uh, volume. But uh, this is where we find out she's going to be like on the B team with Josh, you know, as a, a reservist. Um, uh, what is Niles calls it the outer team. So she's there and uh, she's getting acquainted with uh, with Josh. And we get the first sign of her, uh, her, her invisible friends. That's her power. She can project invisible. Fr- Is she in the show? Yes. Um, okay. They introduced the idea of her in season one, and then season two, she shows uh, up, she shows up um, at being basically imprisoned within Danny the Street. And okay. so, in season two, um, spoilers. In season two, uh, the end of season one, the finale was at the after their battle with Mister Nobody. They somehow got shrunken. Danny the Street became Danny the Brick, mm-hmm. and everyone got shrunk to like thumb size. Mm-hmm. And a couple of episodes into season two, they all um, they all resume their normal height, but Danny is still a brick. And the rest of the season, a lot of it deals with Dorothy. Okay, okay, yeah. Because Dorothy, she kind of becomes a like a point of view character uh, because she's kind of our like our look into the Doom Patrol. Even though she's very very bizarre herself, she's you know kind of meeting these people for the first time here. So we do see that she has her invisible friend powers here. Uh, she like manifests like a giant insect that scares the hell out of a. You know, Josh, and then apologizes for, oh, you know, sorry, those things pop out of my head sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we get an aside with Rebus uh, visiting uh, Eleanor Poole's fiance, which is pretty cool um, because we didn't know a whole lot about Eleanor Poole other than the fact that she was the doctor who was looking over Larry, who got, you know, turned into the, what do they call it, the something marriage or the, oh boy, what, the chemical marriage, is it? Yes. Yes, who was swept up in the chemical marriage and became a third of Rebus. But uh, we see her with her fiancé, who is just like, what in the hell's going on here? Which, yeah, stands to reason. But they do have a... I don't want to call it a touching uh, little breakup scene, because uh, Rebus is very, very aloof during it. You could tell that the, the, the fiancé is having his heart broken here. And he actually smashes a picture of them and cuts his hand up. And he, you know, the second part of this bit, he's like washing his washing the blood off his hand, and they say goodbye. And he goes to hug her, and he's like, and and Rebus is like, uh, "Don't get blood on my jacket." It's like, <laughs> okay, it's yeah, a little it's a really emotional read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's, but it's so it's so damn weird. But uh, do they actually get into into Red Jack's land here? If at the end of Yes, yes. They actually do cross over. They do the William S. Burroughs thing, and a door leads from the hospital into Red Jack's realm, but only for as long as it takes for them to get through it, because after that, someone else opens it, and it's just to the next hallway. But uh, they make their way in. They see the, the butterflies, and Cliff sees that uh, Rhea is uh, is Red Jack's betrothed, and 
where Jack says the wedding's over, but uh, I don't know how, how legit that is. All right, that takes us to the conclusion of this story, which is uh, issue 24, The House That Jack Built. The patrol wages an assault on Red Jack at his mysterious, mysterious home to save the life of Lodestone. Uh, I forget how they defeat him here. Oh, they release the butterflies. That's right. That's they release right, the yeah. butterflies so he can't – because they're not – because what we have here, he has like literally thousands of butterflies pinned to a board because he's living off their agony. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Crazy Jane has she's she has some very weird visitations here, um, very odd scenes. Like there's a dude with like a platter with hands and razors and shit. Very weird stuff. And but somehow she comes to the thought that she needs to release these butterflies, and she's not sure she's supposed to do it, but she does it anyway. And uh, Red Jack is stunned long enough for Larry to put his fist through him, or Rebus to put his fist through him, and he he goes down. But uh, at the end of it, uh, Jane's like, she's like, I released the butterfly. Should I have done that? And uh, <laughs> Cliff's like, yeah, yeah, you should do that. That's a good thing. And Cliff gets his arm ripped off here, uh, which is going to start a trend of <laughs> Cliff's body being destroyed time and again. Um, I think for the lo- for a little while during this run, he has a completely black robot body uh, for a part of this because his body just keeps getting destroyed over and over and over again, which... I guess is another one of those bad things about being, you know, a brain in a robot body. It's you're being destroyed. You don't even feel the fact that you're being destroyed, but now you're just less usable than you were before. Um. So I thought this was a fun and inventive villain. This was another yeah, like sure. over the top, weird, esoteric presentation, uh, but a pretty straightforward narrative. Too. Yeah. Um. You know, uh, Donkey Kong grabbed the princess and went, you know, went went back home, and they went after him. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so the last issue we're going to wrap up tonight. Uh, Dorothy Spinner has her period. Yeah. Dor- <laughs> <laughs> so this issue is entirely dedicated to Dorothy Spinner and her imaginary her imagination produces these monsters that are coming after her. And I think she has to learn that that's what's happening and that she has to control and she has to learn how to control this particular ability, which I, you know, which I think by the end she's able to do. Yeah. Um, this is one of those issues where if you don't mind a timeout from the Doom Patrol stuff and you don't mind spending some time with this character, it's actually really good. If you're like, who cares about Dorothy Spinner? Give me more, you know, Doom Patrol fighting weird bad guys. You're going to hate this. Oh, yeah. And, and, it's, and it, doesn't even have the, it doesn't even have, like, the regular artist on it. It's Doug Braithwaite instead of, uh, instead of Richard Case. And... Uh, it suffers for that. Uh, Braithwaite's a great artist, but it just doesn't work here. Um, the Dorothy looks even more bizarre than she's supposed to here, and uh, Josh looks like a member of Kid and Play for a lot of this here. He's got very high hair, but uh, parts of this are very, very haunting. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things it's. Like, it's weird when you think about the stuff that used to scare you as a kid, you know? I think that that's, like, a, a very ripe thing for for anybody to try to consider, like, the, the weird things that freaked you out. And, like, she ha- she's in this room with a television on, right? And it's just, like, a t- table. And every channel she turns to, it's just this table. And it's just... That freaks me the hell out. Because, I mean... I don't know about you, but I remember having, you know, my old school two dial television set, you know, mm-hmm. where you have the UHF or UHF channels underneath. And like you, you'd flip the, you'd flip the top lever to like U or a, or whatever the little thing was between 13 and one. And then you would like flip through the other, like the, the smaller dial to see if you could get anything in. And like, I remember doing that late at night. And, like, hoping I'll find something, but at the same time hoping I wouldn't. Because no matter what I was going to find there was probably something I shouldn't be seeing. Even if it was the most innocent thing in the world, it was something I shouldn't be seeing. And that got under my skin something fierce. And seeing, like, Dorothy with this television and changing the channel and it's still this scene with a table. Nothing happening, just a scene with a table. Freaks me the hell out. I don't know if it's just a weird trigger for me, personally, but it really set the tone for this issue. And, and it goes completely batshit after that. So going in, I was already kind of on my edge. And then all the weird shit happens on top of that, which just totally drove the point home. Um, 
So I actually like this issue a lot. I like the time spent mm-hmm. with Dorothy. Uh, I think she's an interesting character, and I thought, you know, I, I'm I'm drawn to things that are psychological in nature, or I wouldn't mm-hmm. be doing what I'm doing for a living. So uh, that is the heart of this book: is this kid's mind and her trying to figure out which end is up. Um, and so uh, I really enjoyed it, and I and I really yeah. enjoyed this whole trade overall. It um, it's one of those books where you brought up the X Men, and I can I can definitely see giving this to somebody who's never heard of it before and never watched a television show, but really likes the X Men and be like, hey, have you you know if you want to try something? It's a little bit more adult. It's a little bit on the esoteric side, but it 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 points to the X Men. Uh, I would give him this book, and I think that that person, that imaginary person, I just invented. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they would like it. I think. Yeah, I think Grant Morrison's a very strong writer. Um, you know, I'm very sensitive to the idea of like writers not being able to get out of their own way. Like I said before, mm-hmm. you know, and and you getting like a baby Dark Side and a Dark Side War that made no sense. <laughs> um, I, I'm not afraid of big ideas. I'm afraid of convoluted ideas. Exactly. And and, and if this is an indicator of what the next. 40 some odd issues are going to be it's not convoluted it's just complex complex or... yeah and complex yeah. does not have to com- complex can also be straightforward of course so yeah uh, I really appreciate the fact that you pointed us to this and mm. uh, there's going to be a season three so there'll be an opportunity for me again to say to you hey what Doom Patrol do you want to look at next <laughs> I wonder if if I'll throw you a curveball and we'll look at the John. No, no, we won't look at the John Byrne stuff. Nobody well, should look at the John Byrne. I'll stuff. tell you, there's a new. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. There's a new Doom Patrol uh, li- limited issue series. Um, Way to the world. Yes. <laughs> Not good, eh? <laughs> Not great. <laughs> Not great. That's uh, what I, uh, yeah. I, do you just not like Gerard more, Way? Yeah, I I don't like the second half of Gerard Way. The first, as we talked about, I, we did uh, we did that brick by brick last year. Mm-hmm. The first like four or five issues of that, I, I would I would put up against any Doom Patrol. I thought it was very very good, but I think Gerard Way he might be one of those writers who can't get out of his out of his own way. No, you know, pun on his name intended. But it's just, I think he was doing the Morrison tribute band, and thought he was doing it better than Morrison, which he he did not. He was also putting his book writing, and this is me projecting completely, but he put everything went on the back burner because he has other things to do. Comic book writing is probably not his most glamorous gig, and as such, it got pushed to the wayside when he had other more profitable and glamorous things to do, which is why we'd get six or seven months between issues. And then we'd get the issue, and it would suck or it would be a fill-in issue, or it would be a funny ha-ha instead of a continuation of the story. The second run here, the uh, Way to the Worlds thing, I, I, Gerard Way, I don't even think he wrote the entire thing. He brought in guest writers for, like, every issue. It was, like, him and someone else. And uh, it wasn't great. It really wasn't great. What did you think of Keith Giffen's run? Fun. Keith Giffen was doing... Keith Giffen came in after Infinite Crisis. Now, before Infinite Crisis, the Doom Patrol was the John Byrne Doom Patrol, which is to say the only Doom Patrol, because John Byrne made it so nothing else ever happened before he picked up his pencil. So the Arnold Drake stuff, the Grant Morrison stuff, the Paul Kupperberg stuff, the John Arcudi stuff, none of that happened. The Doom Patrol were a brand new property as of 2004. John Byrne was writing the first word on them. And it sucked. It was absolute garbage. Infinite Crisis happens, and there was a wonderful page in Infinite Crisis that showed every iteration of the Doom Patrol shattered. So, like, we know that they're all out there. And then they kind of merge. And then we go to Keith Giffen, who had to make everything work. So Keith Giffen was able to take elements of Drake, Kupperberg, uh, what's his face, Morrison, uh, Pollock, Arcudi, Byrne, even, 
and he put it all together and it worked and it was beautiful it was really really well done and it went about 20 issues before DC had uh, dropped a big old dump in the toilet and needed to flush it and uh, we got the new 52 so you do uh, you, that's why we can't have nice things <laughs> um, there's a trade mm-hmm. uh, Doom Patrol we who are about to die yeah, we who are about to die. Yep, that's a good one. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, we could we could probably do that one down the line. So well, one of us will try to remember that for next year. Um, <laughs> all right. In the meantime, um, next week we're doing Marvel. Yes. And then we close. That'll up. be very different in tone than this episode. I'm sure. Of it. <laughs> and then uh, the following week we end No Shave November Christian month. With Jeffrey Dahmer, an unauthorized biography, which I'm dying to talk to you about because I have to know, and I don't want to know right now because mm-hmm. I want to close up. But uh, we're going to have a lengthy discussion as to why in the hell you picked that book. Um, oh. <laughs> so get ready for that. <laughs> yes, that's going to be a fun one. That is, I'm looking forward to that. I'm always down to talk about Hart Fisher. So uh, we will indeed talk a lot about Hart okay. Fisher. I'll, I want to pitch you on watching the uh, the Doom Patrol series. I don't know if you have HBO Max. If you don't, you can't watch it. But mm. um, if you you know if you want to give like a you know a month uh, a try, and I you know I think they give like a month away for free, mm. and you want to watch something with your wife, it was my it, that and Watchmen were my favorite shows of last year. Oh wow! I mean, as as far as the kind of television that I like and I watch, and that I think have something to say and just you know I, I, I'll say this and people who listen to this podcast regularly have kind of heard this argument on a handful of different podcasts but I think there are shows that are entertaining but are sort of light on gravitas mm-hmm. and then there are shows that are incredibly well written and have a, a lot of gravitas and have something to say and point to things going on in the culture, and I think you know. And while they might not as be as crowd pleasing as some shows that everyone thinks is like the bee's knees, I'm going to give more weight to something that has a point of view and something to say. And it may be a little hard to watch at times because of the emotional response that it intentionally evokes. Mm-hmm. And Doom Patrol. Season one, um, not that Doom Patrol season two is bad, but do, you know, talking about last year, yeah. um, and I'm basically this is a very long argument to get to. You should watch Doom Patrol, um, <laughs> but Doom Patrol season one and Watchmen on HBO really were pretty incredible pieces of television. Mm-hmm. They were very different than anything else, and the fight that I got into with a lot of people is they all went Mandalorian. Oh my god, the Mandalorian's the best thing. And I'm like, the Mandalorian was sweet, it was light, you know, it was carnival food. My mom, my 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 wife is uh obsessed with baby Yoda right now. Yeah, of course so. everybody is. Who doesn't love a puppy? Um <laughs> You know, like that is the show like like not not to put down John Favreau, but you know, John Favreau knows you know what boys like. He knows what guys want. Right, he was Monica's boyfriend. Damn it! It's, that's right. You know, and yeah, beat up by Tank Abbott. I think John Favreau knows how to give the people what they want without it coming across as check you know check marks. Mm-hmm. You know, we got to do everything on the checklist. You know, or this is you know something that's written by committee. I think it was very the Mandalorian was very John Favreau, but I also think it was very crowd pleasing, and so I kept telling people. The Mandalorian's nice. It's fine. It's not great television. Great television was Doom Patrol and Watchmen. Mm. And the fights I got into with Chris Bailey and everybody else about this. <laughs> I, I just barely started watching Breaking Bad and Dexter. So I, I, I'm way, way behind. Okay, we'll give up on Dexter because I hear it ends like shit. We're in the last season right now. and it's, uh, All right, well, it's, well, I guess it's... finish the ride in, but you're going to hit a tree. <laughs> But I guess they actually announced a new season of Dexter, so that's that's why we're watching it now because the wife 
the wife liked it and she wants okay. to watch the new season so well i'm along for the ride this time and uh and then of course we have the better call Saul uh last season coming next next year so she wanted to catch up on breaking bad and and Saul so we did all that so i well, like, i don't know i i i watch so little and not in like the elitist like idiot box sort of way i just don't watch tv okay. i would love to actually indulge in uh and watch things that i like but i well, if you're ever i'm just such a persnickety room, guy if, if you're ever standing in a room and you're like i don't know what to do with myself maybe i'll watch some tv i implore you to get hbo max long enough <laughs> for you to watch doom patrol and watchmen there you I, go. And if you <laughs> come away from both of those going, Rattledge, you really oversold this. is not as good as you're telling me. I'm, you know, first of all, I'll cry. Second of all, <laughs> I won't ever pitch you anything to watch ever again. There you go. <laughs> all right. Um, speaking of Doom Patrol Season 1, tomorrow Jesse Starcher and I will review Season 2. And then just in time for his exhibition comeback against Roy Jones Jr. on November 28th, we are talking Mike Tyson on the next chapter of heavyweight boxing, championship boxing. So that's what's on the docker for this week. Last week, um, Christian month, we did Starman, Sins of the Father. Uh, Chris Bailey and I reviewed Full Gear. Jesse and I reviewed Striper and our annual Veterans Day show. Uh, this one I'm not going to pitch you. Uh, Medal mm-hmm. of Honor. Uh, it was one season. It was eight episodes, eight different men. Who won, medal of, who won the Medal of Honor in World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan. That's pretty much the eras that they covered. Uh, Andrew Graham and I did our annual Veterans Day slash Remembrance Day show, and that's what he picked, so that's what we talked about. Um, all right, I'll let you do your plug, and then we'll get out of here. Yes, so uh, you could find me over at chrisandreggie.podbean.com where I just found out that I'm allowed to put a whole bunch of feeds on one account now. They just changed things. Uh, used to be where you'd have to pay like hundreds of dollars a year for the privilege, and now it's uh, just part of the regular deal. So I might do something with uh, other things. So you never know. But uh, uh, for now, everything is uh, chrisandreggie.podbean.com, the show that I'm focusing on most now. Uh, by proxy of it just coming out almost every single day, is X Lapsed. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. I'm trying to reacquaint myself with the X-Men after a lengthy, for me, stay away uh, from the X-Men. I, I left the X-Men books in probably 2015, 2016, when they became really, really bad. And I uh, <laughs> heard a lot of good stuff about uh, the Jonathan Hickman run, so I came back to uh, revisit and me being a completist jackass, I ran all over town collecting all the issues that I skipped. So there's that. But I'm up to episode, as this is coming out, probably uh, episode 66 of uh, of X Lapsed there. They, they all run about a half hour to an hour long, and uh, they come out almost every single day, just covering a different book every single time out as I make my way to X Relevancy. I still have a long way to go. This show will probably break 150 episodes by the time it's all said and done, at the very least, probably. But uh, we're getting there. We're getting there, and we're having a good time doing it. Um, Also, uh, blog posts and show notes at uh, chrisisoninfiniteearths.com. There's well over a 1,000 DC Comics reviews there. Those There have been posts there every single day since January 30th of 2016, so... Getting close to 2,000 days in a row uh, putting out content on chrisisoninfiniteearths.com. So if there's a, if, you, if anybody has any free time and they don't want to watch TV, then uh, there's a lot to listen to and a lot to read. Uh, I can't promise that you'll enjoy all of it, but uh, it'll make me happy if you try. All right, folks, this has been Source Material Live. Thank you, Christian, for being with us. I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. See ya.